brain is when two proteins bind to each other, they phys physically attach. And this is a signal, for example, for another protein to become active and to produce a product or, for example, to break down your food. The other way of communication can be that a protein binds to the DNA. And when this happens, it's calling and learning this machinery. And this machinery comes, it reads, translates, and produces a product. For example, product C. Okay. So now we understood what the DNA is, the storing, the information, and the products which are produced based on the DNA of proteins. Why is this interesting that why am I telling you this? Let's come back to the oxygen story. So I've mentioned that the three scientists found a way how the body can sense the amount of oxygen it has. And the most important thing, obviously, for doing this is the sensor. And guess what? The sensor is a protein and it's called if one. Greg Samenzo identified it 30 years ago as a sensor for oxygen in the cell. And he did this because he found that cells which lack oxygen have loads of if one in there. But in contrast, cells which are totally fine and have enough oxygen, they barely have any if one. So he really started detecting it. And some work later, he could really prove that this is in fact the sensor and also an indicator for lack of oxygen. So, what is if one doing when there is lack of oxygen? Why is it there? Why is it so there in this big one too? So, I told you proteins can be communicators, and guess what? If one is a communicator. So what is, what, what's happening is, when there's lack of oxygen, there's a lot of F1 produced. And it's accumulating in the cell, and at some point the chance is pretty high that if one is meeting DNA. And if one can then bind to the DNA, and this is what's happening, then it's called on this machinery, the machinery is reading and producing products. And th these products can be of very different kind, depending on which cell we're talking about again and what the cell needs. Um, I will come back to this later to help you understand what these processes are that are happening and what these products are doing. First, let's understand why there's no HIV-1 when the cell is fine and has enough oxygen. So if you want a cell communicator, um, but now in this situation, there's also a lot of oxygen in the cell because it's totally fine. So what's happening is that the oxygen is actually binding to HIV-1. And this is changing the shape of HIV-1. That's a real game changer in biochemistry. Because now HIV-1 can change the way how it's communicating. Now it's not binding to DNA anymore. Now it's binding to another protein. And it's called BHL. And when this happens, when they bind to each other, this is also a new signal to the cell. This is now a signal that if one is not needed because there is enough oxygen, the cell is fine, so it's just recycled. And this is the reason why we don't see HIV-1 when the cell has enough oxygen. So in a nutshell, what I've just told you, um, HIV-1 is a sensor and it works like a switch-like mechanism. So when there is enough oxygen, it's produced, but however it finds oxygen, which is a signal, to recycle it, so it's gone again, right after the production. In contrast, when there is oxygen lacking, it's also produced and it's accumulated because it's not recycled. And it's binding to DNA and starts different gene products. So, what are these products? Um, I can tell you, if one binds to thousands of genes, and I can also say we don't even know all the genes that if one binds to. This is why this Nobel Prize was important, because it opened the discovery of HIV-1 opened a new field of research to identify all these genes. However, we can summarize in a little bit what we already know. Um, so HIV-1 can do things in the cell itself, which is, for example, affecting the metabolism, so the way how the cell is producing energy. Just remember the story of this marathon. Or it can also affect cell structures in the cell, or how the cell is moving, or if it's growing, and things like, is it dying or surviving? And in the bigger picture, in the body, if one can affect processes like red blood cell production and the production of blood vessels and the size of these blood vessels. Which is interesting and I mean it makes sense since blood is transporting oxygen if one also affects these um, parts of the body. Yeah, so this is interesting, it's basic research. For me it's fun to, to read things about this, but why is this interesting for society? There is a clinical um, application for this knowledge. Uh, I have two examples for you today, and 
doing this example so you also understand a little bit more these processes that if one is starting. The first example is cancer. You probably unfortunately know it. So when you have a tumor, it's basically a clump of cells. And this clump of cells has different layers. So there is an inner layer and an outer layer. And the outer layer, they are totally fine with cells because they have contact to the environment and they get a lot of oxygen and nutrients. How the cells inside that have a problem? Because the cells outside, they don't really like sharing. So they are lacking oxygen and they are also lacking nutrients. But however, a tumor wants to grow and it wants to survive. So they found a way out of the situation. They just use a regular mechanism from the body for them to help them to survive, which is HIF1. They produce a lot of HIF1. And this HIF1 is then helping them, for example, to build new, red, uh, new blood vessels. And these blood vessels are connecting them to the environment so they get oxygen and nutrients. And based on this knowledge, scientists could now develop new compounds against these cancers which are producing HIF1. So for example, when we start the therapy, we can either start HIF1 binding to the DNA or we can accelerate the recycling of HIF1 so that these cancer cells in the end don't have any HIF1 anymore. And without this HIF1, they're in the end dying because they're lacking oxygen. Okay, the second example is about a hormone. It's called EPO. And EPO is produced by the kidneys and also released by the kidneys. And when this happens, EPO induces the production of red blood cells. And this is important because the red blood cells are in fact um, the things which are binding oxygen and transporting the oxygen throughout the blood or the whole body. So when we have healthy kidneys and lack oxygen, our kidneys are producing a lot of HIF1. And this HIF1 then binds the gene from EPO so that EPO is produced. And the more EPO is produced, the more red blood cells are also produced, and obviously more red blood cells can transport more oxygen. However, when we have sick kidneys and a lack of oxygen, we have a problem. Because these sick kidneys, they don't really like producing HIF1 anymore, so we are also lacking EPO. And as a consequence, we're lacking red blood cells, and little red blood cells can also transport only little oxygen. And this state is the disease, it's called anemia. And we already had treatment for this, um, so patients got EPO injected. So this artificial EPO increased the production of red blood cells. However, this had a lot of downsides, because this EPO is really expensive to produce, and also the quality is changing based on the day when we are producing it, and especially patients need to inject themselves, and not many people appreciate that. So now, based on our knowledge of HIV-1, scientists could again work on this um, problem, and they found compounds which are increasing the amount of HIV-1 in the cells, for example, by stopping the recycling, so that it's still, it's still leaking and produces a little bit and it's accumulating again. So the body has its own HIV-1, and then it can also start producing its own EPO again, and this is much better for the patients. So, I hope I could give you some idea of how the body is sensing oxygen by using HIF-1 as a sensor and how it can rebalance when it's lacking oxygen and also to give you a feeling why basic research is in fact really interesting also for society and really important because based on this we can start developing new therapies of different diseases. So we now have five minutes for the questions. So if someone has a question, so with the second, the, you will be approached with the person's microphone. <laughs> so all fast. Okay. Uh, how fast does uh, does it react to increasing or diminishing uh, quantities of oxygen? So your question is how fast HIF-1 can be switched on or off. Um, so I would say the production of a protein, for example, like HIF-1, takes maybe two hours. And then, of course, it takes some more hours to increase the effect. And then, depending on what HIF-1 is doing, for example, when we produce red blood cells, it takes maybe two, three days to produce them, and they need to develop a little bit longer, so that after a week, you see the more feel and effect. But that too really depends on what you want to do in the So if it's a shorter race or a shorter climb, it will be a major effect to move on quantities. 
So you can say, for example, when you go from less high altitude or for having shorter radius, it, it goes faster. I wouldn't say that. It depends on the biological process. So when you go to high altitude and you need more red blood cells, it always takes the same amount of time to produce red blood cells. But for example, the production of red blood cells takes something like a week. But changing your metabolism, how the cell is producing energy, takes maybe half an hour. Okay, that's what I want to say. Thank <laughs> you. 